Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the opening keynote session of the 2019 Global Education Conference. We're delighted to have Tom Vanderark here. Tom is the is an advocate for innovations in learning. As the CEO of Getting Smart, he advises school districts and networks, education foundations, and funders and impact organizations on the path forward. A prolific writer and speaker, Tom is the author of Getting Smart. Smart Studies That Work For Everyone, Smart Parents, and Better Together, and has published thousands of articles, co-authored more than 50 books and white papers. He writes regularly on gettingsmart.com, LinkedIn, and contributes to Forbes. Tom, thanks for being here. Thanks, Steve. Great to be with you. We're going to let you share your slides now. Hope those are live. They are perfect. Great, we're good to go. You are good to go. Awesome. Um, would love to keep this uh, as interactive as possible. So Steve is going to try to keep an eye on the chat window, and uh, we'll we'll jump in with uh, with questions and comments as we. Uh, as we take a look at this um, topic, responsive schools. Um, I, I want to start and end today just by, um, by I guess my wish for the day is that you, you think about what it means to be alive with possibilities. Um, when you watch the news, there's a lot to be worried about, but I, I want to try to make the case that um, I would love to see schools alive with a, a sense of possibility, and we'll we'll talk about what that uh, what that means today. Let's let's start out by um, by taking a look at the this remarkable new century. Now that we're a couple decades into the the twenty first century, I. Um, and in the chat box, if, if you want to make a note of why you think uh, the 2020s are going to be a remarkable decade or why this century that we're in is, uh, is so remarkable in the sweep of history, uh, go for it. Um, but I, I have a half a dozen reasons here that I think set the stage for um, this idea of being responsive in uh, education. The first is that just recently we crossed this threshold where half of us live in cities. Um, and also, in a related note, about more than half of us are on the internet. So about four of the seven plus billion people on the planet are now connected and, and almost four billion people live in urban areas. So that suggests to me, um, perhaps the, the greatest learning opportunity in history is really connecting those next 4 billion people uh, over, over the next 10 years or so. And it's gonna be at 5G speed. Uh, so connecting people at what is now sort of un unbelievable speed is a, is a really amazing learning and working opportunity. I guess the challenge of that is now that we all live in cities, how to create livable, sustainable, uh, workable cities. Second thing is in the last 20 years, we've really seen a tilt towards Asia. And now half of the, the world's economy, um, or very, very soon, the, about half of the world's economy will come from Asia. And in the last few years, we've seen the Indian economy uh, pick up substantially. It's now bigger than the UK. It's twice that of, of Canada and Russia. And after this tilt to Asia, we'll see a tilt to Africa. It's quite possible that the African population will double by uh, 2040. They could be almost, uh, Africans could be almost a third of the world's total uh, by then. In terms of the economy, I I would say that we're a couple of years into a, a different economy, a new uh, economy, one where behind the scenes, artificial intelligence and, and the subset that I've shown on the right, machine learning, 
uh, are really reshaping every single sector. The, the net of working with smart machines is that every field is becoming computational. And that's true if you're a soldier, an accountant, a lawyer, um, a real estate agent, uh, if you're in a, a STEM field, if you're in manufacturing, every field is now uh, computational. And so the question in, for every field is how do we um, address big questions with big data sets? These are super complicated questions. And as a result, we're more and more often working in big uh, multi-disciplinary uh, teams. The ironic thing is that we're often doing it as freelancers uh, or contingent employees. So we're doing more work in teams, but um, with less certainty about where our next job is going to come from. We increasingly live and learn and work on, on platforms. And the, the net net of all of that is that these big complicated man-made systems are often colliding with um, natural systems in, in new and um, unforeseen ways. And that's driving novelty and complexity. That means my grandkids are going to see maybe five, maybe 10 times the novelty and complexity that, that I've seen in my life. And I, my career was in the information age. So it's a, I think AI behind everything has important implications. 20, not more than 30 years from now, we're going to see the rise of super intelligent computers. This is good news and bad news. It's going to help solve some of our most vexing problems. Um, we'll be able to solve many diseases. Uh, we'll be able to create clean and inexpensive energy. Um, we'll be able to take a lot of the drudgery out of work, but it's also going to pose a set of new existential risks. Uh, Stuart Russell wrote about that in his new book, uh, Human Compatible. And he and others would argue that we've got maybe 20 years to, to really get in front of this and build algorithms that are human compatible, that um, are uh, transparent about the bias that exists in, in these systems. So building in controls for uh, what is likely to be super intelligent computers is going to be a really important development in the next uh, 20 years. The good news is that if you have a good idea, it's much, much easier today than it was uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago to get funded. Um, about 250 billion in venture funding uh, will flow in 2019. What's really new is that half of that is non-US, um, particularly in China. I want to note that uh, when, when we started Learn Capital 10 years ago, uh, there was almost no venture capital in education. And, and now there's a couple billion a year. So maybe uh, almost 1% of that global total is flowing into education and learning. Not what it should be, but a, a remarkable increase. And almost um, 500 billion in philanthropy will flow just in, in the United States. Uh, so the, the net net of that is if you have a good idea and you want to start a company or start a, a nonprofit or an initiative, it's much easier to get funding uh, than it was uh, 10 years ago. One thing that really concerns a lot of us is the climate crisis. We just finished the hottest October on record. And ironically, in the first couple of weeks of November, the country went into a deep freeze. And so we're going to see these crazy um, flips in the weather from extremely hot to very cold uh, to, to big storms that move very slowly and dump massive amounts of rainfall. Uh, remember in 2017 when we had Hurricane Harvey that had come just uh, two months after another record-setting storm in Houston. Uh, so we'll see these, you know, once in a hundred year storms coming every few months in, in some places. Uh, we have the Amazon burning. And many experts would say that the 
2020s and the 2030s are really the the last chance for us to to do something significant about climate change that if we don't change the trajectory in the next few years that we're going to speed past uh, two degrees of warming to three or even four and that's going to mark uh, very significant changes in in life on earth for billions and billions of people so let's take a look at these interesting turning points um, the the good news is we're seeing ai used for good in many many cases there was just a, a great conference on this in um, in switzerland that the un held more and more people are connected more people are taking climate action we're seeing a lot of schools and organizations pay attention to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, hashtag global goals. We're seeing the business roundtable advocate for stakeholder value, not just shareholder value, kind of a broader view of success. Uh, autonomous vehicles are, are gonna make our roads safer, make transportation more convenient and more, uh, more accessible. Uh, the, the flip side is a lot to worry about. This 2020 election is going to be the first one significantly influenced by synthetic uh, content or deep fakes. We've seen a, a rise in populism around the world uh, where people are really tricked into supporting an agenda that doesn't uh, really do much to meet their needs. Um, we're in a full surveillance society. We're seeing um, a spread of drones that uh, that can attack just about anyone anywhere, complicated systems and rising income inequality. So it's it's a point where it's a good news bad news story where our kids are walking into a complicated world, one where we've left them a lot of problems, but one where there is um, new opportunities to work with smart machines and make a big difference. So with that backdrop, you know, I'd love, I'd love your take on what does it mean to be a responsive school? Uh, in other words, how are responsive schools um, coping? How are they adjusting their approach given the remarkable uh, and sometimes disconcerting time that we live in? Tom, you should be able to switch back to Zoom to see the responses. It'll leave this slide up for us. All right, should we stop sharing for a minute? Not necessarily. If you go back, if you, if you get over to the actual Zoom program, it should, it should let you see the chat. So you're on a Mac and I'm a PC guy, but yeah. I'm actually a Chromebook guy. But if you, how would you like switch between windows? Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, the multinationals handling data, that's very, uh, very prevalent. You know, in the United States, we've sort of punted to Facebook and we want them to fix our privacy problems. So how to help governments deal with these um, new and really complicated um, Barbara says that schools need to be student centered. I think that's a great um, answer, Barbara. And I, I would say building student agency, their, their sense of being self knowledgeable, their being confident of their ability to act on the world is super important. So when you say student centered, I think about agency, being proactive, Jennifer, thanks. Maybe being nimble. Start from the outcomes that kids really need and then back map. Mark, that's a terrific answer. SEL, the social emotional learning uh, has to be, I think, at the top of everybody's list. Yeah, the four C's and resilience, really building resilience. Project-based learning, place-based. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, the factory model, right? It um, it doesn't make sense anymore. I, I think I think we need to be having that conversation. Thanks, Lucy. Creativity, mindsets, yeah, student agency, asking questions. So this this idea, uh, Margie, 
a question um, asking, right? The, or the problem finding might be even more important than problem solving, right? Making sure that you're asking the right questions. Yeah, at risk kids, celebrating the questions. Thanks. That's a super, super good list. So let's, um, let me flip back. You should just be able to click on present again. So Tom, somehow you muted yourself. All right, we're back. Here's 20 uh, quick answers um, that, that I've been thinking about. The, the first is that uh, I think res um, responsive schools are really intentional about their culture, about an in inclusive culture, one um, where the adults are uh, really intentional about uh, behaviors and about how people uh, are treated. It, it's related to this, this next one that, that responsive schools know and care for students. Um, I, I wanna add that this, I think, in, in addition to being you know, relational first, is also has to be about safety. And this is today, it's physical and emotional safety, but um, good schools have um, concentric circles of often an advisory that might be 15 students, and then it might be a cohort, and then it might be a house, and then a larger school, so that there are nested relationships where kids feel um, known and cared for. The sense of belonging uh, is probably the most important thing that we can create in a learning environment. This is a picture of High Tech High, one of my favorite schools. And uh, Larry Rosenstock talks about schools that have a, a common intellectual mission. Um, at High Tech High, they, they have a common set of design principles. So I might amend this to say it's not only a, a vision of a desired future state, but it's a set of, it's a framework that includes uh, design principles of, that guide how the school iterates. And the, the, the school does, can, can share this common set of ideas um, succinctly, but you can unpack it for a day. So it's, it's both concise and it's deep. Uh, responsive schools are really intentional about their outcomes. Many of them have gone through a process of having a community conversation. We like to ask, um, what's happening in the world or how's, how's the world changed since you were in school? Uh, what, what do you think that means for you and your kids and your community? As a result, what should kids know and be able to do? And then finally, what kinds of experiences are most likely to produce those outcomes? Check out portraitofagraduate.org from Battelle for some great examples. This is Daniel Kurt. He's the head of the lower school in, uh, at the American School of Paris. And, um, I, I think they've got a great outcome framework and, and Daniel's really intentional about how they combine uh, personalized learning and maker ed and project-based learning uh, to really get at the priority outcomes. Responsive schools know the, the learning science. Um, I included just a, a quick summary from Digital Promise, but if you go to digitalpromise.org and look at the learning um, science tab, they, they have a terrific summary of, of learning sciences that remind us that high expectations matter, that uh, hard work and make the, the ability to make mistakes is really important, that spacing and retrieval is important, um, that we recognize interest and autonomy, as we just talked about safety and well-being are super important, and that the environment can really matter. 
I want to encourage you when you go to Digital Promise also to take a, a look at the Learner Variability Project. This is a, a, a new project that helps you understand um, the different ways that young people learn and develop, and it helps you match strategies with um, observations that you're making about learners. Uh, they just did a, a great update on their website, so check that out. That's the Learner Variability Project at digitalpromise.org. Responsive schools engage uh, students in meaningful work. Um, these are a couple of schools at, uh, from El Paso. I think the best active learning turnaround story in, in America in the last 10 years, this was the worst example of test prep culture and curriculum uh, that led to cheating and embezzlement. And when the new superintendent, uh, Juan Cabrera, took over seven years ago, he put in a, 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 an active learning vision. And, and what you see on the left is a, an example of a dual language ninth grade STEM classroom where uh, they're using uh, blended learning and hands-on learning in both English and Spanish in a, in a beautiful way. On the right side, you see one of the 10 new tech academies that they launched to jumpstart their, um, their agenda there. So a great example of using these micro schools, small academies on existing campuses to illustrate the future of learning in El Paso. And so in all 90 of their schools today, they really do a great job of engaging kids in meaningful work. Some of you mentioned place-based learning. Teton Science uh, Schools, tetonscience.org are really best in class at uh, thinking about uh, place and immersing kids in the place. Um, and wherever that place is, um, they, they not only do a great job with their own schools, um, they have almost 20,000 young people visit them uh, for on-site um, uh, camps. And they're also, uh, they've launched a national network called the Place Network, and that's a network of rural micro schools that all share um, the basics, wonder, discovery, and experience. Responsive schools um, really enable youth contribution. One of our favorite examples is One Stone in Boise. Uh, they talk about creating an army of good for good. I was there uh, two weeks ago at a student voice summit that their uh, young people ran and uh, it culminated with, with uh, a dozen youth pitches uh, for ways to make a contribution in the community. And uh, this is the subject of our new book. We really love this idea of helping young people figure out who they are and what they're good at and what they care about and how and where they'll make their first contribution. Doing uh, deep work means that you have structures that support deep work. My favorite example is Science Leadership Academy in, um, in Philadelphia. Um, this is Chris Lehman with his son. Uh, so that's the proud look of Papa on, on the right there. But in between them, you'll see a set of core instructional values. And what I love about SLA is that they're consistent classroom to classroom. So you go down the hall to the math classroom and you'll see a senior presenting a lesson uh, to other students. So they really live these values of inquiry and collaboration and presentation, and they have a structure and supports and professional learning that all uh, support uh, deep work. Responsive schools really value quality public work. One of my favorite examples is at Palo Alto High School uh, where Esther Wojcicki and her colleagues have built the best journalism program in the world. Uh, students lead 10 different publications uh, that are world-class in nature. And I, I love the fact that to start a new publication, students have to build a business plan and show how that publication will become self-supporting. So a great example of student leadership, quality, public work. Good schools also uh, promote demonstrated mastery. Some people call this competency-based learning or performance-based learning, but it's really inviting kids to do authentic work and 
uh, allowing them to move on when they've demonstrated mastery. Uh, Lindsay is a small district in the Central Valley of California. They do a, a terrific job. You can see on the left, um, the, they've broken down some walls between classrooms to allow students to move um, easily during reading and math time into uh, leveled groups. Kids in Lindsay do a great job of goal setting every day. You can stop every kid and ask them uh, what they're learning today and what they want to learn tomorrow. Responsive schools uh, provide career exposure and guidance. Um, the best example of that is Cajon Valley, a small K-8 district east of San Diego, where uh, between kindergarten and eighth grade, they cycle through 54 um, integrated units that explore different career opportunities. And during each of those, young people are asking themselves, who am I and what am I good at? What do I care about? What are my values? And how do those things line up with these career opportunities? So a great example of career exploration that really allows high school kids to make thoughtful pathway decisions. Responsive schools also connect kids to opportunity. You know, for 20 years, we've been pushing kids to college, and um, that's not always a good idea, especially if you go to college without a sense of purpose um, and, and make an expensive mistake. We're seeing more and more high schools uh, create really thoughtful pathways that are what Ryan Craig would call uh, in his new book, uh, A New You, a hard sprint to a good first job. You're seeing a picture here of Ramtech in Ohio. It's the best robotics training program available to teenagers on the planet. Uh, these are three of the, the first teens to earn um, certification in the two leading robotics uh, programs um, in 2014. And they were immediately hired by Honda, who gave them a scholarship to college. They're now all out of uh, college. Um, they they are Honda certified, uh, all making six figure salaries. And this is really my first um, important exposure to these earn and learn ladders that don't force you to choose between college and work. They are college and work um, and very, very lucrative work. Uh, responsive schools attract and develop great teacher talent. Um, one of my favorite examples is Summit Public Schools, a network in California and Washington. Um, the, the cool thing about this is that um, students uh, four times a year get a, a two-week break called a, an expedition, and they get to choose from 50 different experiences. And during those expeditions, the teachers get um, eight to 10 weeks of professional learning time. So they get time to go visit other schools uh, to work together. It's really the most extensive commitment to teacher development um, in the sector. And it's, um, behind it is a, is a beautiful competency-based system where um, teachers progress and unlock lear learning and leadership opportunities for themselves. So personalized learning is for kids and for teachers. Responsive schools distribute leadership um, this is Dennis from uh, Singapore American School. It's a big school on a single campus, um, about 4,000 kids. Um, of the 400 faculty, uh, over 180 are in leadership positions. So those are grade span team leads. They're initiative leads. Uh, they're teachers that are, are coaching. So a great example of distributing leadership to a lot of folks on campus. Responsive schools really embrace equity in their culture, in their hiring, um, in the way that kids are, are known and cared for, um, in, the, in the way they look at data. Uh, this is Will from, uh, from One Stone. He happens to be one of two patent attorneys that work in that building. So looking for non-traditional sources of uh, great talent so that kids 
uh, see themselves in leaders on campus. And responsive schools have inspiring learning environments. This is uh, one of my favorite examples in, in Albemarle County, that's Charlottesville, Virginia, where they've been building these beautiful new multi-age classrooms. Uh, th there's about six classrooms here, but you can see they're broken up in um, different levels and they vary between um, in, in ceiling height and so it can feel both cozy and expansive simultaneously. There's lots of different kinds of seating, high top, low top, hard and soft. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful and inspiring environment. And we're seeing more and more people um, think differently about learning spaces. Great schools have great advocacy partners. Uh, my favorite example is Dallas County Promise. Uh, this is the best promise um, program in the country. Um, this is Eric Ban, who runs the program. We just visited him uh, last week. He's working with um, almost 100 high schools in the, in the county. And I get a, a very data rich email from Eric every Friday night um, that's telling the story of how schools are doing a better job of uh, getting kids on track to graduation, helping them fill out FAFSA forms, um, applying to college, um, and then getting into college. So Dallas County Promise is part of Commit Partnership. They, uh, their success in Dallas led them to a statewide effort and they were really behind um, HB3, the, the giant $9 billion school funding um, bill in Texas this year. So Dallas County Promise and Commit uh, have been great partners both for Dallas and for schools in Texas. Um, as we conclude here, um, responsive schools really partner with youth and family services. So they provide youth and family services and they, they bring them into the building. One of my favorite examples is Da Vinci Schools. This is just south of LAX in El Segundo. Uh, they're part of the Wiseburn District. So it's an interesting combination of a set of charter schools that were adopted by a K-8 district. And together they work closely with nonprofits like, um, like South Bay Families. So we'll, we'll close with a, a thought from uh, High Tech High. I just love how they uh, describe um, their intent to integrate hands and minds um, in inquiry across multiple disciplines, engaging kids in meaningful work, work that matters to them, to their teachers, and to the outside world. And if you... Uh, We'll, we'll close before we jump into some comments with a, a little inspiration. We call this our the Just Do It poem from uh, William Stafford. But I, I love this thought um, of, in the second line, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? And then he closes with, what can anyone give you greater than now? Starting right here, right in this room when you turn around. So I, I, uh, I hope you take what we've talked about today and, uh, and try to put it into practice in your school uh, this afternoon, right when you turn around. Let's, uh, let's dive into some questions. So if you've got questions for Tom, go ahead and put them in the chat. He's gonna watch that. Tom, there's something of a dilemma here, right? This is, this is a profoundly positive vision. When I ask people what percentage of graduating high school seniors in the U.S. graduate as competent adults, I get kind of shocked looks and half laughs and a sense that maybe it's a very small number. How do, you, how do we reconcile kind of the numbers of kids who leave school not feeling good about themselves and the desire to have everybody get a good education? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, Steve. Um, 
I'm afraid we've been focusing on the wrong things. Uh, and I, you know, I have culpability for this, having helped to stand up um, the All Kids College Ready. Uh, this was all done with a, with a real equity focus, but I'm afraid it and No Child Left Behind um, and even Common Core sort of uh, solidified this discipline-based six or eight period day, this disconnected um, content-oriented vision of high school. And so the net net of it is just high school sucks for most kids and it's, it's boring, it's irrelevant, it's difficult, but in ways that are not very meaningful. Um, I've been writing about mathematics lately. I think what we do to, in, to kids in high school math is ridiculous. The focus on symbol manipulation and memorizing and regurgitating formulas, you know, rather than um, meaningful problem solving, um, learning data science, using probability and statistics to attack real world problems. Um, those are all examples of creating school for adults and not school for kids. So I think it starts with a new mission. Um, somebody at the outset talked about a student-centered mission, but that really does mean starting with, uh, with the kids um, and making agency a priority. And if we have schools that are based on routine and compliance, we'll never grow kids that are ready for novelty and complexity. So this means schools that help kids come to understand who they are, um, what they're good at, what they care about, and how and where they want to make a difference in the world. I think that means a very different kind of a day. Uh, let, let me just close this answer with, um, I, I think it implies a fundamentally different architecture for school. I was at um, Purdue Polytechnic High School in Indianapolis last week and Purdue Poly and, and One Stone are examples of schools that, that don't have courses in the traditional way. They engage kids in skill sprints and projects, projects that are meaningful to them and their community and skill sprints that help them uh, accelerate their, their, their skill development in, in uh, reading, writing, communication, in uh, problem solving, in useful mathematics. Uh, and I think conceptualizing school in that way of meaningful projects and skill sprints is much more student-centered, much more engaging, and, and ultimately much more valuable to young people. Okay, you've got lots of questions in the chat. I'm going to scroll up and get you started on the first one. Heike asks, do responsive schools support the Fridays for Future initiative or is this more European? Sorry, I don't know that. Do you? I don't either. Um, I like the idea. I mean, uh, if I would do it, do whatever you can. And if that's start, starting on Friday and connecting kids to the community, go for it. Next question is from Connie. What are the leverage points you see in systems to move the education this direction? Yeah, um, take what you can get. Um, work from the edges in, start anywhere you can, you know, start today, start small, iterate up. Uh, so I can't, I can't tell you in your system what the answer is, but start in your classroom, start with another teacher, create a blended unit that's more connected to the community. If that works, turn it into a summer school. If that works, turn it into a micro school. Um, you, you have to be really opportunistic here in looking for ways to make school more valuable. So Tom, is there an inherent dilemma, and I'm interested in the audience who are global here. Yeah. Mandatory public schooling is essentially a sort of a form of governance, right? right. It's a way of sort of doing a good job of bringing people into a culture and managing it. Is that sort of at its heart at odds with the kind of progressive ideas of individual agency? meaning we've had really good independent progressive schools for decades now. Yeah. They, never, they never become the primary way of schooling. And is that because schooling in and of itself is actually really geared toward sort of 
developing people to be workers? I think there's always tension between equity and innovation. Um, I, I'm, I'm really drawn to this question. I, I, I'll, um, I'm leaving for South Africa right after this where I'm gonna be talking to school heads about how to innovate without getting fired. Um, and it, it's really at the heart of this tension between equity and innovation. Um, how do we create systems that are equitable, but how do we make sure that we are nimble and, um, and responsive? And so I, I think that's true at a school level, but it's, it's, as you've pointed out, also true at a system level. I, uh, so Steve, my answer would be that I, I think, um, a portfolio approach is, um, is the right answer. And in most cities in America, we have the beginning of a portfolio approach where there's a variety of options created and being created that serve the needs of um, diverse families and kids. In Europe, it's interesting to note that they're not hung up in the um, um, unusual way that we are in America with church and state. And, um, so, so there are lots of faith-based schools that are also public schools, but they exist within a, a public portfolio. Uh, so I, I do think there's a um, healthy view. I, I'm uh, Dutch by background, and I appreciate the Dutch point of view on this, that it's quite easy for groups of families to form new schools within the public system. And, and I think that sort of nimbleness um, and responsiveness is going to be really, really important um, as as the pace of change picks up. There's an hour's worth of questions in the chat. I don't want to presume to choose which ones. I'm going to let you take a minute and scroll and just find some that are interesting for you. There have also been a couple put in the Q&A. So if you click on that Q&A button down at the bottom, you'll see three questions that have been asked in the Q&A. Is that too much for you? You want me to pick some or are you ready to scroll through? Um, great, great questions. Thanks so much to everybody for, uh, for your responses. Um, how do I make my rural school uh, responsive? Uh, so I think this is super um, an important question. I, um, I'd love to have you take a look at um, playschools.org, that's the place network that I mentioned earlier. I'm really excited about the opportunity of um, rural micro schools. I think there's an opportunity in America to open um, thousands of micro schools, many in rural areas. We, we've probably lost 3,000 rural schools in America. Um, they were consolidated into, into bigger schools and that was thought to be better. And I think it's been disastrous for many rural communities that had lost their high school and as a result sort of lost the, the fabric of their community. So micro schools that are deeply rooted in a sense of place that introduce kids to the place that they're from, that take advantage of uh, both the um, local places, online learning, and then also travel to distant places. I think you can create very inspiring, very small schools many of which that could operate in connected networks. Um, we think this is really, really terrific. I would say that it's important that states um, have equitable funding that uh, makes this possible, that, doesn't, uh, that don't rely on um, uh, just on local tax dollars, but where it's been equalized across the state based on need. Um, Kat talked about the, this tension between innovation and uh, equity is, um, I think this is so important. Um, how I, I love, I love to quote Pam Moran here. She, she was an educator in, in uh, Albemarle for 32 years. And uh, as a superintendent, she said, how can I say yes to every opportunity that, that a teacher team brings forward and simultaneously, as soon as that works, how can I create access for others? So 
this tension between saying yes and supporting innovation and then making sure that every student um, in, in every house in uh, your system or your state has equitable access to high quality. And think about the spaces that, uh, that she was building in Albemarle. So um, one or two at a time building out these beautiful spaces that, that in and of itself creates inequity in a system. So you have to run bonds to make sure that everybody has access to those. So you have this tension of, of cre innovation creating inequity but then putting your vision on a timeline so that you can guarantee to your community that every kid in our community is gonna have access uh, to these kind of experiences in the next three years. So keeping that tension um, alive, I think is, is the best you can do. Eradicating poverty and promoting e equity, um, thanks. Um, I am really worried about um, income inequality. Um, so AI is really powerful and it's allowing kids, um, even in high school, to address some of the world's most pressing problems in really, really sophisticated ways. I'm very excited about that. And simultaneously, AI um, has this aggregating power where um, it's helping the biggest companies become bigger and the richest people become richer. And so what this is gonna do is press um, every municipality, every state, every country to come to terms with the fact that we're gonna see in accelerating income inequality. So how to deal with this productively, how to learn to share basically um, could be the most important issue of our time. We can, with the resources we have today, and the, and the problem fighting ability that we're developing solve the problems we face. We can end poverty in the next 10 years on planet Earth, but it will require us to build some new agreements on how we share the extraordinary wealth and benefit that have been and will be created. So how to educate young people to be part of that sharing solution and that sharing economy I think is super important. Tom, want me to pull one from the chat for the Q and A? Yeah. So Mark asks, do you fear those who seek to undermine progress on mindset, grit, differentiation, et cetera, by claiming that hard data can't find sufficient positive impact for those approaches? Yeah, well, it's just a dumb answer. Um, uh, cause it, it, so I, so I appreciate the question. Um, I, I think what Mark is concerned about is that people are looking to traditional measures, um, for new answers, you know, so, um, do, do you see an, uh, an improvement in standardized test scores, um, as a result of, um, tr trying to teach grit? And, and growth mindset. Um, so I, I um, led the XPRIDE for a few years, which was really fun place to work where we tried to create um, big challenges for some of the world's biggest problems. And one of the, we often had to create new metrics um, that would tell us if we're becoming successful. And so anytime you try to do something new, you, you do either do the best that you can to measure with old metrics, but you do have to create a set of new metrics that help you monitor your progress. So one of the new challenges, some, uh, a number of you mentioned social emotional learning. We do have to build a set of new metrics that help us understand human development in um, more fully and what it means to have a sense of agency, what it means for me to uh, collaborate effectively and authentically. Um, Mark, let, let me give you an example from one of my favorite networks um, is the New Tech Network. We, we wrote a book together called Better Together. It argues that um, the work that everybody on, on this webinar is doing is, is really, really hard. It's complicated in many ways and that you should find your tribe and work with them 
Uh, one way that the new tick network answers this question, Mark, is that they have rubrics that measure agency and collaboration on every project that every student does. And so they go through uh, a, a, a difficult collaborative project and then they get feedback on how they exhibited agency and the extent to which they collaborated in that project. And so to me, that's a great example of building a, a new set of measures that provide uh, valuable feedback on what might be the most important outcomes. So the, the new challenge for us as school and system leaders is build dashboards using um, the best data that we have available, use survey data, use observational data, um, let people know that it's, um, that it's new data and it's going to um, get better over time. But if you only rely on historical standardized test data, that's all we'll ever have. So use new data to show progress of learning when and how you can, I guess. Is part of this that there's just a, a temptation when there's data to use it from a top-down standpoint rather than from a bottom-up? Meaning at core, true education comes from the, from internally, from inside out. Yeah. It's really hard to measure and it it's is. really hard to produce. And so it's a lot easier to say, okay, well, we've got this external data and now we're going to do this in order to make the data better. Is yeah. that just a human dilemma? It, it is, but let's, let's try to walk into it instead of ignore it, right? We, we, we built this system of standards-based reform and I already admitted some culpability for that um, to promote equity, but we used a set of bad measures inappropriately and it led to a set of terrible um, unintended consequences. What we need to do now are build new measures that better describe human development. I'm a big advocate now of uh, what we call an extended transcript. So for the next few years, you can use your existing transcript. That's a list of courses and grades that you took in secondary school. But I, I think schools and systems ought to create an extended transcript that better describes the new capabilities that young people have. And to, to Mark's point, I think we can include measures of and examples of mindset and, uh, and grit, the success skills that you need to be successful at work. Um, so schools can um, develop a, a growth transcript that shows how kids have grown in these areas. And then it's even better if it's a click through to a, a portfolio that shows evidence um, of how young people have grown. Building regional uh, agreements around those growth transcript. We're starting to see this happen in, uh, in Dallas or on the Dallas County Promise. I think we're going to see this happen in Kansas City around the Kauffman Foundation's Real World Learning Initiative. These regional agreements around an extended transcript, the use of portfolios, exhibitions of learning. I think all of these are going to be um, better ways of describing and sharing um, human capability. And the bottom line, Steve, is we have to help kids get better at telling uh, their own story in, a, in compelling ways. It's so funny because my own dad, who ended up being Dean of Admissions at Stanford and then Dean of Admissions at Princeton, he was a ne'er-do-well and kind of reinvented himself after the army. And so one of the concerns I think that sort of exists is all of this tracking, does it take away the opportunity for kids to actually sort of figure themselves out and reinvent because there's this huge record of where people feel like they already are. Right, there's, there's tension in every good idea. Um, and and I, would, I would add to that tension, I, I am now an advocate of um, what I mentioned earlier, a hard sprint to a good first job. Um, I want that to be a good first job where lifelong learning um, is embraced and where there, it is open to opportunity, where it doesn't preclude opportunity. Um, I, I recognize that that idea could turn into pathways that feel like they trap kids in, in a track. 
Uh, I'm really worried about retracking schools, especially uh, where low-income kids are tracked into, into certain pathways and, and that this could be driven by these learner profiles. So uh, I, I think it, 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 your question suggests that we are, are cautious. I think it goes back to this equity and innovation paradox, but um, I am excited about the number of schools that we're seeing that are beginning to reframe their mission as one where they want to help kids make a difference in the world, where they want to help young people uh, begin to contribute. And I think that's a really, really productive direction. And if we live into that mission, I, I think we can avoid the, the problems that you spoke about. All oh, these are such good questions. Okay, so we promised people five minute breaks between the sessions. So Tom, do you want to leave any information about yourself or how to get in contact with you or what to read before we close out? Yeah, um, so thanks for uh, joining the Global Education Conference. This is a terrific event. Um, I have a blog up on Getting Smart today, gettingsmart.com, that runs through these, uh, these 20 ideas, so take a look at that. Um, we have a, a, a new book coming out on place-based education uh, with ASCD in a couple months that will go into a lot more detail on um, the idea of rural micro schools and how every school can um, help kids take advantage of the place that they're from. So check out uh, gettingsmart.com. If you want to learn more about school networks, uh, take a look at Better Together. And thanks for being with us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Tom. That was really terrific. Okay, in about four minutes, we've got a whole set of sessions starting. Hope you have a great day in this first day of the Global Education Conference. Bye now.